speaker is Dr. Azim Sayed. I would like to introduce him. Uh, Dr. Azim is a pharmacy supervisor with Kaiser Permanente Orange County, he, where he lives um, with his wife and two children. He grew up in SoCal, attended both undergraduate and graduate schools in the area. He has served in a capacity of community direction within different roles and is currently an active member of the Strategic Planning Committee at the Institute of Knowledge, and he's also joined the Advisory Board for Olive Community Services. Um, now, what he has not mentioned here in his bio is that he's um, a, a hafid of Quran and also uh, been a religious uh, leader uh, in different capacities at different institutions. So he does have a background in mm. spiritual um, knowledge as well. So welcome, Azim. Uh, let me allow you to share your screen. Um, but you're welcome to first address our audience, who is happy to see you here. Yes, thank you, uh, Zainab. And uh, uh, assalamu alaikum, everyone. And welcome. Uh, and thank you for having me. I'm really excited. Alaikum <laughs> Uh, very happy to be here among you and uh, hoping to have a discussion and uh, a lot of learnings exchanged in the hopes that we can uh, do the great um, proposition that was just presented, which is uh, a wellness challenge. And um, I think I'm going to be giving you some very general overarching uh, themes and topics to kind of think about. And you're more than welcome to internalize them as you see best, as you see uh, important. And I'm going to be sharing my screen and ask that if you have any questions, you can um, please hold them to the end. I will definitely address the question. Uh, and if you um, are muted, uh, you can also come um, on the speaker to ask the question at the very end. So um, thank you again for allowing me to be here. It's a pleasure and honor and um, very, very, privileged to be a part of this uh, panel uh, with you all. So um, let me go ahead and share my screen here. And I'm going to try that one more time. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I believe you can see the PowerPoint now. Yes. Great. Thank you. I'm just going to be minimizing everything so we can look at this on a full-fledged scale. And I could take some extra time on some slides if we need so. Okay, so again, uh, it's a really uh, great opportunity for us all to get to know exactly um, what we mean when we say that often uh, we have heard and know about uh, physical wellness, we know about mental wellness, which are extremely important for our well being, but also part of our overall health is our spiritual wellness. And that is what I'll be covering today. As was stated, I'm more than um, uh, just a guest. I'm now a member <laughs> of all the community services and very happy uh, to, you know, spend this time and also additional time uh, seeing um, any things you'd like to discuss, but also uh, following up if needed after. And what I'm discussing can be shared in terms of resources, so you can refer back to them as well. So the agenda for today will be just an introduction to the topic about spiritual wellness, some other terms that have been used are spiritual intelligence, spiritual personality, and those are all synonymous, meaning they're all uh, names for the same uh, basic concept. Um, so we'll be doing an introduction and how that ties into also not only general well-being, but specifically as uh, people of faith and of the Islamic tradition, 
how that is uh, relevant to us. We'll then talk about, again, uh, research-based and societally driven components of health and where spirituality fits into that. And even if not termed exactly spirituality, we'll um, find out together and explore um, the different dimensions of what it means to be aware of your inner self and spiritual side. We'll then go into some frameworks of how to process and exactly place where spirituality fits into the bigger picture. You know, all of us are very keen on keeping up great habits and good practices. And this is exactly where spirituality can also play a part in those routines. We'll then give some practical examples of how to build in some spiritual wellness um, regimens into our day. Um, this again can be in different forms and different shapes and something you may already do. And this is exactly why I'm having this uh, conversation is um, this can be a, a chance for me to find out what you do and let me know uh, what works for you well and you know what you found that really is well worth it. And then finally, we'll do a summary and conclude with some references and questions and answers. Again, we'll be at the very end. You can um, record it um, in the chat, which I can come back to, or you can just simply uh, speak up uh, once I'm finished speaking. So, all right, um, this is quite a bit of information. I, uh, I just wanted to give you a disclaimer. This is the most busiest uh, slide I have. So after this, it will get very easy to follow and you'll find um, a lot of, um, you know, digestible information in terms of uh, what you can practically take away. So there was actually a study done uh, just a couple of years ago, um, and I have a reference to that later, but it was published uh, in actually the Journal of the American Medical Association. And they found that the International Consensus Conference on Spiritual Care and Healthcare, um, spirituality was defined what you know when people say what is spirituality it can mean different things to different people and that's okay um, what it means in terms of a little bit more objectively speaking a little on the side of what helps everyone spirituality is defined uh, the way individuals seek ultimate meaning purpose connection value or transcendence and transcendence if you're unfamiliar with the term um uh, maybe I can just get a feeling for how everyone um, is doing in terms of following along. W what does the word transcendence mean to you in terms of this context? Yeah. I think we might have some ideas and, you know, we can share later, but transcendence in this context, just to put it in perspective, is something greater than, you know, looking past or looking at the larger uh, than what you are just experiencing or feeling. That has to do with uh, what spirituality truly means, even scientifically. Now, going into the um, faith-based tradition, specifically of the, the Islamic faith, and every faith has spirituality as a cornerstone of how people believe, how people act, and how people go through their experiences. But uh, uh, Imam al-Ghazali was a um, philosopher about uh, more than a thousand years ago. Uh, he was actually a person who had learned the tradition, but also was a father of pretty much modern day psychology and someone who was considered in some circles and um, terminologies as a mystic, someone who really you know, perfected the science of mind, but also the science of how to process that within yourself and be a better person. And he put all that into um, writing and we're fortunate enough to gain from his tradition and his legacy. Some people might call him the most influential thinker in psychology, period, regardless of faith. Uh, that, that wouldn't be putting him um, on any sort of undeserved pedestal. He's very influential. So his writings are, you know, full of discussions on the composition of the human psyche. So spirituality comes from different parts of ourselves, 
But if you were to divide it, it has to do with what you know, the intellect, um, what you, you know, feel the soul. Um, and then your, that's in Arabic described as the ruh and nafs, which is your ego. And this can be habits. So there's three parts at play when spirituality is going to be uh, something you are working on. What you think, how you feel, and what your tendencies are. All three matter in terms of defining and sometimes changing for the better or sometimes not so better uh, of your spiritual um, quotient or your spiritual capability. So again, those habits, the internal and uh, the external. So um, Dr. Siddiqui actually wrote an article on spiritual excellence and I found this very um, appropriate for our discussion. He said, we human beings do not only have our body and mind, we also have a soul. And the soul is another word for spirituality. And he said, the soul is sometimes described as the spirit, again, the ruh. You can see that's uh, used interchangeably between soul and spirit or heart. And this is not talking about only the physical heart, but this is also talking about the spiritual heart. And just like any muscle of the body needs exercise and doesn't do too well when it's not um, put into use, just like that, the spiritual heart also needs some exercises. And the spiritual heart also has things that bother it, some things that better it. And it's um, left up to people to find out what really uh, matters inside to them, to their spiritual heart and soul, and they can work on that. So components of health here have to do with, uh, thank you uh, for saying mm -hmm. the answer about transcendence. That's a great answer. Sorry for getting to that late. Um, but, you know, the study in Harvard was actually a multi- center, it looked at over 20 years of literature, almost a thousand articles about what spirituality means within the context of how people um, can be uh, better in their health. And they found that ways to improve uh, include organized religion. So things of any faith really matter. So they are a part of who you are and they can play a part in who you can become, especially if you're trying to move towards a certain target and direction in improving. But it extends well beyond and includes ways of finding ultimate meaning by connecting to other things. So it's not only about that person and how they're doing in life, it's about the things around them. And this um, first box, you see things that define your spirituality are oftentimes things we are, find ourselves in, such as family, such as community, and sometimes the uh, most uh, simplest, but also the sometimes the most serene solution is nature. We are, we are among the creation, um, you know, that's placed uh, uh, for a reason, uh, and we are uh, uh, gifted with the opportunity to be here. So tuning in to where you are, who is around you, really helps your spirituality. And if we talk about uh, the life uh, of a person, most of us would probably look to for the essence, uh, essential uh, requirements for how to be the most complete person. That is uh, the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Islamic and prophetic medicine really takes into account three major areas. It's all about eating. Uh, you know, some people make eating um, such a important part is such a big deal and some people don't give it much credit at all but it is important um, as the saying goes you have to eat to live but not just live to eat so eating is important but you don't want to make it um, the absolute reason for you doing everything you do but again using that as one piece to a larger puzzle and the second part of that is exercise. So keeping yourself active. And that can mean different things for different people. Does everyone have to eat the same way? They do not. Does everyone have to exercise the same way? They do not. But as long as you're eating for what's best for you, as long as you're exercising how best you can, and um, that brings you the most benefit, then if in case you sometimes, naturally speaking, will dip your eating, your exercise, regardless of where that's taking you, you'll have a what's kind of like a lull or a low point. 
And how do you help yourself out of that with the remedies that were shown to us that are naturally based? Um, and those are many in number. They have everything to do with practices such as, um, you know, honey uh, and including that in your diet, um, you know, black seed, simple, simpler things like that, or even um, things like sleeping early, sleeping on time, um, being able to be um, alert and cognizant, meaning um, very oriented to what you're doing and being present, just being purposeful. Like if you're finding yourself in a moment, ask yourself, hey, what am I trying to get out? Um, what can I do that really helps me take the best out of the situation and leave with a positive feeling? So it's just mindfulness. And so what you do with your body um, is one aspect. And the second aspect, um, specifically in the Islamic faith, is how your attitude is. So whatever you're going through, not only who you are defines spirituality, but how you view who you are and what's quote unquote happening to you can really help you uh, get your bearings in terms of spirituality. So the three aspects of a great, well-rounded outlook on life that helps regardless of faith is having patience, which is called sabr, having gratitude and shukr in the Islamic tradition, and contentment, which is a ridha. So this sabr, shukr, and ridha are some things that our um, spiritual healers and spiritual traditionalists and practitioners have pointed to and really helps um, putting things in a good understanding of what is around you, who you are, and again, what you go through. So it's all about attitude, but it's also about how you deal with um, your body and mind. And spirituality, as we'll see, there's a quote next, is essentially the interlinking. So if you have uh, your physical body and your mind, spirituality is what helps combine both of them together. Um, just want to make sure this is the next slide. So processing frameworks. The uh, International Wellness Institute is, again, a non-denominational, non-religious uh, um, institution that put forth this excellent um, schematic diagram of how everything really plays into how you spiritually are doing. It's not something you can just single out and do on its own. It's tied into a lot of factors. So let's start with the uh, left-hand side of this. It has to do with your physical wellness. And we just mentioned that the consistent prioritization of physical self-care, the engagement, the engagement in a variety of health-enriching behaviors. So it's establishing good practices. Um, and we'll get to, um, as I'm uh, now famous for an acronym to remember how to go about this in their practical tips. But physical wellness is com comprised of prioritizing physical self-care. And then we move to the top of this slide here, intellectual wellness. So it's also challenging yourself in your ability to think and evaluate and stay engaged in your mind. Creative stimulating activities that lead to the learning, personal growth, and the sharing of one's unique gifts with others. So this can also include what we do here at Olive is we share like I'm doing with you and you're sharing with me. This is a part of intellectual wellness. And then moving to the right hand here, occupational wellness is also tied into this. This is the personal satisfaction and enrichment one receives in life employment, yeah. academic, yeah. or what many of you are doing, volunteer work. Excellent point to realize that your spiritual wellness is tied to a lot of stuff, but it's also tied to a lot of other people's spiritual wellness and their other, um, uh, you know, other components of their wellness. It's not all just, you know, in a silo or somehow it's just, uh, you know, existing on its own. It's very interconnected. And spiritual wellness on the bottom right here is exactly one piece out of the six here. So the development of an appreciation for the depth and expanse of life and natural forces that exist in the universe. Now, again, this is a little bit more of a broader definition. And we would say that, and Dr. Siddiqui in the same article quotes and says that spiritual well-being is actually the most important because it helps you both in this world and can also help you in the afterlife since we have that as part of our belief system. 
And then social wellness is a key component of that. Just like it says here on the bottom, the contribution to one's environment and community with an emphasis on the interdependence between others and nature. So social wellness is not only about you know, where you are in your family, where you are in your small circle, whoever that's around you regularly, but it can also be the community that you're a part of. And last but not least is the bottom left here, emotional wellness, the awareness and acceptance of one's feelings and the capacity to manage behaviors related to one's emotional state. You know, realizing what it is that helps you feel a certain way, just pointing it out. You don't even have to necessarily um, you know, do anything about it, but find out what makes you happy, find out what makes you fulfilled, find out what makes you not so happy or angry, find out what makes you a little frustrated. And just being aware of that is already a progress and a huge step in terms of realizing that all that plays a part in who you are spiritually, mentally, and physically as part of this grander, very beautiful uh, you know, um, intricate, intricate complexity uh, that we call life that has a lot of things um, uh, relationally interdependent. So, you know, the scripture that guides everything we do uh, in life uh, for Muslims uh, says, uh, those who prosper, uh, those will prosper who purify themselves. You know, uh, the Quran specifically calls um, success is through struggle. So purification takes different forms. It can be, you know, you somehow getting rid of bad habits, you somehow realizing that if something takes too much of your time, then you're going to do less of that. So that's a struggle and that's a purification. It doesn't necessarily mean only purifying the inner, it can be purifying the out, outward. So if you have, for example, um, you know, you're, uh, you can't say no to you know, uh, junk food, for example, you know, that's not the best for you. It's okay to have that once in a while, but if you feel that you can't really help yourself or can't control it, those are things you want to give yourself some extra time to work on because you know, it's not too good for you. So purification comes, um, both in physical, mental, and even spiritual. So, you know, for example, if you find yourself feeling, um, really alone, if you find yourself feeling really, um, away from things and not finding joy in things. What can you do? We'll get to those um, solutions in just a bit. But you'll have to seek assistance and you'll have to realize that you can't do it alone. Whether it's a person and whether it's the entity that helps you come out of everything, which is your ultimate calling in connection with the divine, whatever it is, you can't feel like you are all um, by yourself with nothing to, um, you know, uh, feel good about. So like we said before, Islamically, the physical and mental versions of a person are linked spiritually. That's why spirituality is so important. If that middle uh, important connecting um, bond is broken, your physical and mental states can be somehow compromised. So we believe uh, as Muslims and people of faith strongly that spiritual, uh, spirituality is a very key component, if not the most important component of a whole person. So here's uh, exactly what I had um, suggested and I um, will go into now. The middle is kind of our uh, great uh, takeaway point. If you remember really only this from the presentation, please um, see if you can uh, highlight this in your uh, you know, mental notes or your physical notes. Um, you have to really be open to adopting good practices. You have to learn uh, to uh, take up and establish great habits that last long and that take you far and make you, uh, you know, a person that's very positive and productive, but also make uh, the things around you very uh, helped out. So adopt good things that help you and help others and make that a practice. This can also mean sometimes leaving. Uh, things that, you know, don't really um, uh, help you, but actually wind up harming you. So these are important things to keep track of. And then adapt. Once you find yourself in a practice, it's great. It's helping you. It's helping others. Um, you know, you find that it brings you a lot of satisfaction. That's great. But sometimes what happens is you realize that you can't keep up. You know, for example, if you were doing a routine of um, walking um, outside for uh 
you know, 45 minutes every day um, and you find yourself, hey, you know, it's raining. I'm going to still keep that as part of your routine. It's more important to leave it there and then uh, um, adapt it, uh, meaning change the time, change who you walk with, change where you walk, but still walk. That's the essence of having the good practice and um, essentially sticking to it. So be adaptable. You know, for example, if you are in the habit of getting up at night, but other people in your household are not, you know, you don't have to wake up the entire household, do it for yourself and find ways of doing that. Maybe, you know, helping somebody else say, hey, do you think we can make one day out of the month where we all maybe wake up earlier for, you know, prayer and reflection and some sort of special spiritual activity? So again, be adaptable. You know, don't only focus uh, on what you can do, but focus on what you can do for others. And realize that you may have to change what you're doing, especially if it's making a difference in your life or the lives of those around you. And then lastly is accept. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in realizing that I'm going to do what I want to do and nobody else can make me do anything else. Um, that's not the uh, most healthy outlook uh, and uh, idea to have. Um, just like it says here, form healthy practices, be open to change and process what you're going through positively. So accept the fact that, you know, there are some things that you can do. So there are some things you won't be able to do too much of. Um, accept the fact that somebody um, can help you do things you can't do on your own. So you have to be open. And this is exactly where the two um, uh, shapes here on the left um, help come into play. Prayer. Uh, whether that's our daily five prayers or any connection and extra uh, supplications like du'as, like recitations, like regular litanies or what's called repetitive uh, readings from any you know texts or any sort of uh, books we do. Anything that helps you ground yourself and gives you a, a peace of mind and peace of heart, that's important. And prayer is probably, the five prayers specifically are the most important way to do that. And mindful prayer, mindful activity of what you're doing. And seeking help. I think a lot of us sometimes feel like we're, uh, you know, going to only look to certain people, take care of it ourselves. We don't need help, but it's essential. And uh, I was reading from the Khalil Center, which is a um, um, psychosocial um, uh, institute here in Los Angeles and has chapters around the United States, um, you know, they really emphasize um, what kinds of professional support they can offer among other institutions. And, you know, we do that here at Olive in uh, ways ourselves. We uh, provide help, you know, whether it's pairing and the Olive cares, you know, finding out what other people need. Uh, this can be, when I say professional, it doesn't have to be someone who is a licensed or someone you are paying. It can be just you know, going to get to know somebody, volunteering your time to do something um, meaningful where you build relationships together. So that's also considered a professional um, circle or capacity. And then you definitely want to make time for the two things on the right here, which is, you know, uh, reflecting. So taking moments, time out to yourself and just doing internal ev evaluations of, you know, what's working for you, what's not working so well, hey, you know, maybe I didn't get to do that, I can do it later. And realizing that time to yourself will give you a chance to slow down and disconnect and uh, not just stay in the constant, really hyped up, um, high strung activities and lifestyle we sometimes lead. Um, and what's really important here are the two words listed in the shape uh, under reflect, moments of internal accounting, holding yourself responsible for not only what you're doing, how you feel, and how you can go about making uh, any of the adjustments you need to or adapt uh, to what you do, what you need to do for moving onward and, you know, continuing your progress and journey. And constructive concern. I think this is a key thing. A lot of us have a lot of concerns. You know, I want to find out what's going in with XYZ person, but am I going to be constructive in my approach to them? Am I going to be, you know, pushy or nosy? Or will I choose the right time and right place to talk to a person I want to get to know better? So constructively doing it concerned in a concerned fashion, that's really important. And balance, uh, the last shape here, is between um, the choices we have for habits, lifestyles, and what you put in for your time and effort. You know, nowadays, we have devices and technology all around us that really help us hone in on figuring out, hey, where's my time going? How much, um, you know, 
time am I spending for work related items? How much time am I spending for, um, you know, perusing or browsing my phone because we have screen time apps on our phone now. So this gives you a good idea of the fact that if you find yourself drawn to one thing, taking a lot of your time and effort, that's probably not a balanced approach. You wanna make sure you are giving equal time to the things that matter the most to you and because you might matter the most to someone else, that also is something you want to devote your time and attention to. So habits, lifestyles, and choices, and trying to give a good spread, you know, an even distribution of how uh, you are doing things and what you're giving time to is pretty critical. Yes, uh, to answer the question, uh, these slides will be available afterward and uh, we appreciate everyone being on. So let me just get to uh, a few things that will um, lead us to the wrap up here. Um, this is a, uh, you know, a summary, but it is so uh, unique. And I thought it was a brilliant uh, explanation of how everything really comes together. And this is actually, believe it or not, from uh, a Yapin Institute article. If you don't have um, an idea or a previous uh, interaction with Yapin Institute, they have an app, they have a website, they have a YouTube channel. They are one of the premier think tanks uh, of American uh, Islam, but they're also the think tanks of a societal um, cause that is linked to wellness and to um, you know, well-being, including spirituality. So spiritual wellness is a big search and a huge um, focus area of what they do. And they brought together uh, a wonderful interplay of how things matter. And I'll give you some um, examples of how this kind of all ties in. So your spiritual personality or your spiritual wellness is tied to what you know and what you do. That's the first two boxes here knowledge and deeds. In Arabic, uh, the words are also listed there uh, for the sake of brevity and just to keep it very easy to follow, I'll be focusing on the English words. So knowledge is uh, what defines a person's spirituality, but you know what you know comes from two things. It's experience and your judgment, meaning your experiential judgment of what you've been through and you realize works for you and you know and you formed an opinion about based on uh, experience or information that you know works for you that comes and defines the intellectual aspect of a person. And then the next uh, right hand side is just as important. You know, what you do is usually um, a result of two other factors, just like what you know is a result of two factors, what you do is a result of action and restraint. It's sometimes just as important to do something, but it's also, as you can see here, uh, equally important not to do something. And so holding yourself back, you know, do I really need to take that extra spoon of uh, sugar just to make my tea sweet? If I know I have uh, my blood sugars out of control, no, you shouldn't. You should know that it's better for you to restrain uh, because ultimately that little trade-off between uh, not enjoying it then, but it's still helping you in the long run is sometimes a deal you have to make for yourself. So it's about doing and sometimes holding back or not doing. And so what does um, a personality look like when it all comes together? Sometimes you have people that are very high on um, having a lot of strength and power and they're very physically uh, strong and capable and resilient people. So if you can see here, the hand of power, just trying to find the cursor here, hand of power has two things that it goes back to. We can see one going back to judgment and the other going back to action. So some people are very driven and it's okay to be a mix of all these, but specifically that's why some of these are shaded, uh, not with one color, but uh, multiple colors. So just like you see here, you can follow the color. Judgment is brown, this is brown, action is blue, and this is blue. So if you are a person who is very particular about having rules and regulations, uh, and you're focused on, you know, doing more of a doer rather than um, holding back and being kind of uh, cautious and, uh, you know, uh, thinking things through a lot more, then you are 
probably in something that would match the personality of one of our pious predecessors um, and the specific Yaqeen article that was written, by the way, for uh, just uh, context purposes. This is written by a psychotherapist and a psychiatrist. So it's, and they're both Islamically trained. So this is kind of a very, really well thought out, well-rounded, um, I would say one of the best um, balanced approaches I've seen to how to approach this. And I do have uh, a link to the Yaqeen uh, website that can find you the paper that this came from. So the uh, example of this on the bottom left, hand of power would be, for example, um, uh, the Islamic personality of the past, one of the four righteous caliphs. Actually, each of these leads to a righteous caliph is of uh, Ali. Uh, may God be pleased with him. He was a powerful person and his uh, power was in his physical um, prowess or you know strength. Um, and then let's look at the next personality that can come out. Again, you can see where you fit in. And sometimes you have to take a combination. It doesn't mean you only seclude yourself and... Um, close yourself off to other possibilities, but voice of justice. This is again, judgment and restraint. So if you find yourself to be a just person, um, then you are going to be um, a person that you know really thinks about what you're doing and why. And um, this is like uh, the Islamic personality of the past, uh, Omar. Uh, may Allah be pleased with him. He was a voice of justice, always wanting and focusing on being very um, concerned. You know, there, there's a famous uh, saying that goes back to me, just to show you that um, what you do uh, and what you believe really uh, ties in together. And he used to say when he was a leader and responsible for all the Muslims, he used to say things like, if uh, an animal on the road, um, you know, was struck and happened, something happened, uh, just a normal, you know, accident that you would see out there. He said, I would be asked about it. So he was very concerned. He, he had this voice of justice that overruled him. Again, a very important personality, but different personalities. And each of them is equally important. So his was justice prevailing. The heart of inspiration is um, our personality. Uh, the first caliph, Abu Bakr, uh, may Allah be pleased with him. And you can see he was a mix of the two aspects, experience and action. So he was a person who was in the right frame of mind, for example, to learn with his life. When everyone couldn't see through the immense pressure and stress after um, in history, after the Prophet, peace be upon him, left this world, he was the first person because he could take the reins and figure out what to do at that time. He was focused on action, but he also had the experience. He was a little older. So age matters. And that's why it's so important to get what you um, fully can out of Olive because we have so many people here with experience, so many people here with excellent judgment, so many people here um, always stressing uh, good actions. And, uh, you know, they have great habits because they restrain themselves from bad things. So Everyone here is actually a, a great uh, representation of these things. And lastly, the eye of vigilance. This brings in two colors together. Um, this is experience and restraint. And this would be someone like Uthman, uh, the caliph um, that's uh, the fourth in this line, just to give an example practically. Now, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be one of these. You can be a combination of these. You could have a combination, have bits and pieces. You don't only, only have to have two. You can have, you know, three or four or even one. But the point is, these are things you want to focus on. Um, have the experience work for you. Define who you are and what you do. Exercise good judgment. Make it count for you. You know, make choices that will help you. Um, help those around you and help um, those who are looking to you for help. Or you can ask others for help and that can be part of your action. And there has to be the focus nowadays, especially of restraint, realizing that you are sometimes in need of somehow taking a step back, taking it slower, not getting yourself caught up in just feeling like you have no choice in the matter. And that's also um, a ruling kind of undertone for all these things is that Really, you know, we ask and pray that we are given the right combinations at the right time. You know, for example, uh, just being aware of the fact that we're, for example, in a 
lunar month right now in the Islamic calendar that's very sacred. You know, taking a step back and realizing, hey, where am I? Who am I? You know, why am I doing what I'm doing? All these questions are sometimes good to just give yourself a break and ask. Prayer is a great way to do that, to disconnect and kind of reorient yourself about your purpose. But it could just be a quick, you know, um, self-reflection or meditation. Um, so we're, for example, in, in a month, um, what's, what's called Rajab, uh, the, the seventh month, which is considered sacred. You know, um, people take the time to do extra things that uh, are pleasing uh, to um, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, may Allah be uh, Allah, the almighty and great. Uh, but for, the point is, you have to be oriented to time, place, and person. You have to be fully aware of where you are, who you are, and, you know, what you're doing. Uh, and how that really um, can play a part in making yourself feel better or not so uh, better. And I think we are getting close to um, the uh, final slide, which will have questions. I can take those. But uh, if you do have the time, I would highly recommend you start. Just start. And these are selected references. The study I referred uh, you to and really looks at uh, how important spirituality is and, in fact, trains people who provide health care to be aware of where spirituality fits into the grander scheme of things um, is a study that was quoted um, and the first link Harvard has that study again um, but specifically if you're looking for uh, Islamic um, inclination to how to balance wellness I would highly suggest among other things there's many good references out there but please do start with the Afin Institute and all the excellent resources they have. They have, um, you know, quick um, exercises you can do for just meditation and reflection. They have uh, very, uh, you know, uh, detailed papers they've written. They also have, again, like I said, programming you can watch with the family. You can do things at different ages. A great starting point. The last thing I'd recommend you do is look at those six dimensions we talked about in a more holistic way, a little more um, academically and figure out the answer doesn't always have to be one-sided you know if you ha if you used something did something or found something that is great if it's working for you but realize there might be something else you're not fully looking at that could also help you so be open and like we said uh you know uh, be open to um uh, adapt the practice and establishes uh, establish it uh, excuse me adopt the practice and then adapt if you need to change, but also accept if it's something that's better for you. Um, with that, I can stop here and take any questions. I know uh, we have a little bit of time and I'll uh, let um, anyone come online or ask in the chat. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing here and Could give you? everybody. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Could you show us that slide number two, that, uh, that hexagon? Uh, yes, yes. Thank you um, for the great uh, reminder. Yeah, so some of the exercises we can do is, you know, have yourself grounded by just being in the moment and having like your rosary prayer beads, uh, the vicar beads, uh, the masbaha as it's called. It just kind of gives you that tactile stimulation and uh, grounding. So let me get to the second slide and share my screen again about the six aspects of wellness. If so anyone think... else has any questions in the middle, we can take those right now. Yes, please. I believe this is the slide that was being asked about. Is this correct? Yes, thank you. Sure. Yeah, this is from the Wellness Institute. Again, a national um, institute that's uh, dedicated specifically to helping people feel better and they also have excellent free resources about what it really means to be well but also realize what it takes uh, to be well not only um, by yourself but among others any other questions yes or... i have a question yes assalamu alaikum um jazakallah khair for your inspiring presentation as always um, I have a question about this emotional wellness. Um, what is going on around us for the past three years? 
it has been really hard to focus uh, spiritually. Uh, probably most of us are feeling the same way. I'm particularly feel that way because there is so much um, despair. There is so much, uh, we are so demoralized and so much helplessness around us to see the injustice being done to people. Uh, it's, it's, it's really, like you said, Islamically, physical and mental um, wellness is linked to the spiritual uh, wellness. Uh, that, that is true, but physical wellness we can achieve by um, following the medical advice or doing some physical activity and keeping yourself fit. But to gain the spiritual, um, uh, to gain, to have the emotional wellness, I'm finding it very hard uh, that I, it's just, I, I mean, most of us don't know how to, uh, especially young people, I have talked to some people, they, uh, I mean, some people are at the verge of losing the faith. And for me, spirituality is something uh, to, be, to be sincere in your values and beliefs. If your beliefs are shattered, uh, then it is very hard to uh, achieve the uh, emotional wellness. So I, I would like you to kind of uh, talk a little bit about that and how to kind of uh, uh, overcome these uh, despair feelings. Yes. Uh, well, yeah, thank you so much for the question. Um, great, great uh, insight. And this is exactly why I'm so happy to be speaking to all of you uh, to bring up the points that, you know, it's one thing to learn and um, be given uh, something, but hear from what really matters and what really um, works is uh a really important perspective. So just to address that, I think uh, I'm sure there's other people that may have answers here. So I'm uh, welcoming everyone to chime in as they feel they can contribute, please do so. But just to quickly um, talk about, you know, we just talked about uh, the component, um, like we said, physically, we know what to do. If you don't feel well, you know that some things you can do will help you get better. But if you are, you know, often struggling in faith, you also have to realize just like the heart has some things that make it not so healthy, the spiritual side of a person also has things that make it not so healthy. And that can include um, doubts, feelings of despair, um, and you know, feeling like you are just dejected, meaning you're just um, on an island, you know, nobody's uh, caring about me, why should I even uh, really care about uh, anything or anyone? Uh, but to get out of that, I think I had the slide up for a reason, which was to seek help. Um, so whether you um, sometimes are ready for it or not, this is why you have people around you that can help you uh, get to that stage of realizing, hey, I'm not the same person I used to be, or I'm not the best version of myself. And maybe you want to have a very frank conversation with yourself or someone else and say, you know, I feel really sad. Um, do you feel the same way? And open lines of communication up. I think sometimes we tend to think that, um, you know, we have to help each other and do it in kind of um, behind closed doors. And that's not necessarily the case, whether that's going through some sort of counseling um, as a smaller group or a class or seeking help, just like we do for mental health. There's also um, spiritual health. Seeking help in that avenue is particularly important. And um, I, I mentioned one way, which is... Um, uh, a psychosocial service that is provided, for example, from the Khalil Center, um, some uh, Islamic institutions uh, locally also provide that. But it's um, what was stated, when there is an imbalance of physical, if there's too much physical stimuli, your mental may suffer. If there's too much mental stimuli, your physical will suffer. But how to really keep them uh, kind of on a level playing field and somehow, you know, manage it all together as best you can, easier said than done, right, is spiritual. So if you see aspects kind of moving up and down, how to tie that is in spirituality. And if you have to think outside the box and ask others, um, that may be one particular way. And I think I've stated before, you really want to uh, find your uh, ultimate uh, calling and responding, uh, uh, calling out, excuse me, and requesting from um, God and help you see what you really need to do. I think that really helps a lot of people. And sometimes people say, hey, organized religion is just an excuse for uh, giving yourself a good feeling. And, you know, that's, uh, again, something that's 
just thrown out there. I think most people who have experienced religion would speak otherwise. Some people who have nothing to do with religion could say otherwise. So each of them has their, uh, in this case, uh, a relative truth. But we, of course, as people of faith, believe in an absolute truth. And you want to ask who is um, the person who is considered, I mean, the entity in people's lives um, that's considered um, the reason why we're here. Uh, for help and support and divine assistance through whatever you're doing. So again, there's been a lot, whether it's the pandemic, whether we're watching the atrocities of what's happening uh, in um, Palestine and Gaza, it, it really takes a mental toll. And you don't realize those tolls that it's taking until someone else tells you. It takes some time, someone else or something else to remind you, hey, I'm not um, you know, finding the same things valuable anymore. I'm not feeling the same way I used to. What's What's going on? How can I help myself? How do I ask for help? And how do I help others? There's a question on the chat about is mental health different than spiritual health as in Islam? Yes, great question. Uh, absolutely. So um, just going back to that slide, uh, mental health has to do with well-being. And, you know, nowadays, if you call 911, for, 911, for example, um, you are doing so because there's a physical emergency. You know, God forbid there is um, someone... Uh, who is not feeling well at home, so you're calling an ambulance, but it could be a mental uh, emergency too. So you have a panic attack, for example, or you have a breakdown mentally for something else. So mental health uh, is more on the side of what's considered um, the uh, objective, or some people can call it secular, or some can say just a, a means of uh, approaching it more clinically. Um, there are certain things you need to do that have really nothing to do with spiritual health or your mental health. So each of them have exclusive solutions. Physical health has solutions. Mental health has solutions. Spiritual health has solutions. Sometimes they're all mutually exclusive, but they can also be mutually inclusive, meaning what helps you spiritually can also help you mentally, can also help you physically. And now what it is, our job is to find really what helps us. What helps one person is not the same that helps others. So to answer your question, mental health and spiritual health are uh, pretty much two uh, things that are tied together, but they don't have uh, the exact same uh, context uh, always because one's um, how you are thinking, how you're feeling, how your inner self is doing, which can be totally separate from um, your spiritual health, or it might be tied. Thank you. Narmeen, go ahead with your question. Um, so I don't have a question, but I'd just like to make a comment. Thank you, uh, Brother Azim, for, um, for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful presentation. And thank you, Zaina, for bringing it. I think it was a very much needed um, session. Um, I loved um, your presentation. I'm just wondering if we could do a little booklet on those key notes that you have. And just a reminder for us, you know, when we're going through certain things in life, just to have a quick look and 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 help us uh, help us to get ourselves back on track. I really like your presentation, Brother Zain. Um, I think uh, uh, all of you should do something with that. Thank you, um, Go ahead. Uh, is, this is this going to be recorded? This is uh this has been recorded. Yes, your okay. your ask is my your command is my command. So, of course, um, Thank and I, what I, I I don't and Azim, I know you had um a time it's some um other uh, time constraints that you have to attend to. So I really appreciate again your time. Um and and just a reminder, I work at St. Jude Hospital. Some of you know that. And, you know, one of the departments that a faith-based hospital office offers is spiritual care. So spiritual wellness is definitely a part of health that we don't realize. So make sure when, if, if for whatever reason you are, you end up at a hospital or a loved one is, you can, if you, I'm not sure if Kaiser offers that, uh, Azim, does Kaiser offer that uh, service? Yeah. But you can ask for a chaplain. Just to talk to somebody. Sometimes, you know, when you are in that state, a lot of reflections come to your mind and you need somebody to talk to in a non-judgmental way. Um, so please take on that service and ask for it. And <laughs> Believe it or not, they are trying to train more and more chaplains to be aware of different faith traditions so that 
they have the proper responses. I know um, of a Muslim chaplain, do, uh, Sister Sando, Sandos Kolaki, who has spoken at all of several times as well, who's a very unique, uh, you know, uh, uh, personality with some unique training. So uh, does Kaiser have it? Sorry, I didn't mean, <laughs> mean to. Yes. Yeah, so I think most healthcare facilities have. Okay. A, uh, okay. I wasn't a, aware of that. I thought it was a faith-based hospital thing only. Yeah. They have a, I think, a, a requirement uh, once it's asked for specifically, maybe not offering ahead of time, mm -hmm. but yeah, if a patient asks, there is uh, some level of obligation to provide. Yes. So please do take on that service. So thank you, Azim. Um, you're welcome to step away whenever needed. Again, it was truly appreciated. We have some very positive comments here. All of Community Services is a 501c3 nonprofit organization based in Southern California that provides culturally appropriate services to seniors, their family, and the community. Through its physical and virtual interactive programs, Olive engages participants in a variety of ways that promotes health and well-being. To learn more about Olive Community Services, to get involved, or to make a donation, please visit www.olivecs.org or email info at olivecs.org. Be a change maker and together, let's live, learn and thrive.